Good evening, welcome and bienvenidos. My name is Tomas Talamante and I'm Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Muriel Bowser. And I'm proud to welcome you to Mayor Muriel Bowser's first budget engagement forum of fiscal year 2022. We wanna thank you for joining us this evening on this very snowy evening in Washington, DC, but with some cold weather, what perfect way to snuggle up and participate in our virtual budget engagement forum. I do wanna remind everyone, you can go to budget.dc.gov now to interact live with our virtual budget engagement forum. We'll be asking questions there. You'll be able to do our virtual version of the infamous $100 budget game. Uh, and you'll be able to ask questions real time to Mayor Bowser when we get to the question and answer portion of the program. I also wanna remind residents that you can call in now to start asking your questions to Mayor Bowser and her administration for your budget priorities and budget uh, uh, questions. That number is 855-925-2801 and the code that you dial is 9046. We will also have that rolling on the scroll on our uh, live stream as well. If you're out watching from Twitter or Facebook, you can ask your questions directly there, but we do encourage you to join us at budget.dc.gov so you can participate in our virtual forum and answer questions for us real time. The first questions that we're gonna be asking this evening is if this is your first budget engagement forum, and also what ward you're joining us from. And we're already seeing answers coming in and seeing representation from all eight wards, which is very exciting. Uh, before we hear from the mayor, I just want to thank Events CC and our staff here at the Convention Center for being our host. Uh, now we'll kick off the evening with Mayor Muriel Bowser. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it is wonderful uh, to be with you all, and it's wonderful to kick off a, another uh, year of budget engagement forums. I've said frequently, and I'll say again today, that my experience in building a budget, both as a council member and now uh, as your mayor, uh, has been uh, to get feedback as soon as possible uh, from communities. So when I hear the recommendations of the deputy mayors and agency directors, it is in informed um, by what the community knows about the process. I also learned ver very early on that the budget can be complicated. Some of the terms that we use are unfamiliar, and even the schedule uh, may be unfamiliar. So we use these sessions to educate you about uh, how we build our budget, talk to you about uh, priority areas, the things that worked, the, the things that we think that we can build on, but most importantly, to hear directly from you. Um, how uh, at the district's budget in our agencies impact your lives, how it impacts your neighborhood, how it impacts your family. And in that way, we can build a budget that works for all of DC, for all of our residents uh, and communities. Certainly, this is a very important budget season uh, as we look both to relieve the stresses of COVID-19, uh, but also to build for a better and stronger future post-COVID. Uh, so we look forward to hearing from you today. I'm joined by members of my administration um, who are gonna tell you exactly what they do uh, to make the district a better place to live and work. Uh, we're gonna start with the city administrator and the budget director who will talk to you about how we build our budgets, the major components, uh, and then you're also gonna hear from deputy mayors about how our, our district uh, is organized in clusters, and they represent clusters that affect schools, and economic development, and infrastructure, uh, and our human services, and everything it takes to make district government work. Uh, so we look forward to hearing from you today. Uh, there are many ways that Tomas has already reviewed about how you can engage with us now. Um, and until we submit our budget to the Council of the District of Columbia. So with that, I'll turn to Kevin uh, Donahue, the City Administrator, and Jenny Reed, uh, the Mayor's Budget Director. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kevin Donahue, the City Administrator. And in a few minutes, uh, you're gonna have a chance to tell us your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions about how we should spend your resources on your city. To help you do that, we wanna provide some context, though and that context will help you shape the way in which your idea can play a role and have a place in our budget. To do that, Jenny Reed, our budget director, is gonna talk about the process of how we create the budget, when we do it, and its composition. 
then I'll talk about what our emphasis has been during this year, and we hope that'll give you some thoughts and ideas and suggestions for how we should allocate resources next year. Jenny? Thank you, City Administrator, and good evening to all the residents joining us tonight. We're very happy to have you here um, to really help us kick off what is a year-round process for us as we build and execute the district's budget. So as you can see from the chart here, our fiscal year runs from October 1st through September 30th. And where we are right now is really the beginning stages of our budget formulation. So we start under Mayor Bowser's direction with community input. We wanna hear from all of you, what are your ideas, your suggestions, places that we should look to increase funding, places we should look to decrease funding. We take those and we work with our agency partners and our agency heads to craft a budget um, that meets the goals and expectations of DC residents. We then submit that budget to the DC Council. This year that's slated for March 31st. And the DC Council then spends about 60 days considering the budget and hearing from residents as well about what things they like and wanna keep in the budget that we propose. After the council takes a few votes on the budget, we then um, go into what we call the execution of the budget, where we begin implementing all of the funding for the programs and the services that you receive. That's where my office comes in as well. Part of our job too is to make sure we look at how well agencies are spending those dollars and make sure they're delivering the programs and services that you, um, that you deserve. We then move into the accountability phase where we look back on what we did in the past year. The mayor issues her accountability report um, showing how well we met our goals. Our agencies conduct their performance oversight hearings and we release our audit. And then we start again. So that's a little bit about our process. Let me talk to you a little bit about the basic fundamentals of the budget. The district's budget has two main parts, what we call an operating budget, or things that fund the programs and services that you may use, um, such as health insurance or um, your favorite recreation program. That is about $16.9 billion. And while that does uh, look like a lot and is a lot of money, it's important to note that because of the COVID pandemic, we entered into a significant revenue decline and this actually represents a reduction of about $1.5 billion from the prior fiscal year. Nonetheless, we've made it a key focus to make sure that we keep up investments in those areas most critical to our residents' well-being, which the city administrator and the deputy mayors will talk about shortly. In addition to our operating budget, we also have what's called a capital budget. That's $1.7 billion. The capital budget is really important because it helps build that critical infrastructure that we all rely on. So your new school buildings, your recreation centers, also fixing your sidewalks and your roads and your alleys. If we jump to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about how we allocate all those dollars um, and then turn it over to the city administrator to walk in more detail about the programs. So the largest share of our budget, $5.1 billion, goes to an area called Human Support Services. This funds agencies like the DC Health, or the Department of Behavioral Health, or our Department of Human Services that provides critical services to our homeless residents. Our next largest share of our budget is education at $3.2 billion. This funds all the supports for all of our public school children in DC public schools and DC public charter schools. It also funds our Parks and Recreation Department, our libraries, and our Department of Employment Services. One of the next key areas is $2.1 billion for Public Works and Government Operations Department, and we certainly saw today the importance of our public works agencies as they work to clear all the snow um, off our sidewalks and off of our streets. This also funds areas like our Department of General Services that helps provide uh, maintenance to all of our buildings. In addition, we spend about $4.5 billion on what we call enterprise or financing and other. A big portion of this is the debt service that's used to pay for um, the borrowing that we need to do to build those recreation facilities or build those schools. It's also where we include funding for UDC and DC water. Next, our public safety budget is about $1.6 billion. This funds some of our really critical public safety agencies like the fire and emergency medical services the Metropolitan Police Department, 
our Office of Unified Communications that takes all your 911 and 311 calls, and our Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement that provides important violence interruption services. And last, but certainly not least, is our Economic Development and Regulation Administration. This area funds some of our investments in affordable housing through the Department of Housing and Community Development, and also assistance to small businesses through our Department of Small and Local Business Development. So those are just some of the basics of the budget. As you think about how you want to allocate your $100, you can think about how we're allocating them now and how you may want to change that. I'm now going to turn it back over to the city administrator to walk through some of the specific investments we've made this fiscal year. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some of those specific investments. Um, and this is for the, what is happening this year and in the past year. So as you think about this, you may think about things that you think we should expand, we should maintain, or we should shrink going forward. So let me start with COVID-19, which it's impossible for any of us in any capacity that we're in to talk about the past year without starting with COVID-19 and the pandemic. To give you some sense of context, when we constructed our budget, we had no line item for COVID-19. What we spent is over a billion dollars on things like testing, vaccines, contact tracing, PPE, and healthcare. In doing that, though, we also recognize the need to invest in people and in you and in the impacts of the pandemic. So we administered more than $1.2 billion in unemployment benefits, nearly $27 million in emergency grocery distribution, $5 million in childcare facilities, and $135 million in assistance to businesses. So just some of the investments that are listed here that went to some of the ripple effects of the pandemic. Now going to the next slide, you can see six clusters and six areas that you'll hear more about from the deputy mayors. I'm just gonna set the stage and they'll go into some detail about this. To give you some context, education and health and human services together represent half our budget. In education, you see an investment of almost $2 billion in K through 12 public schools. And in healthcare, you see the investment of $365 million for a new hospital east of the river. But you also see other clusters and other areas of our policy uh, that affect you, our residents, and different investments that we've made over the past year to move the needle forward. Now, each of the deputy mayors will talk in more depth about each of these areas, and then we wanna hear from you and what your thoughts or ideas for looking at what we've done this year to help guide what we shape and what we submit to the council for FY22. And with that, I'll turn it over to our Deputy Mayor for Education, Paul Kahn. Good evening. My name is Paul Kine. I'm Mayor Bowser's Deputy Mayor for Education. And across the education cluster, this has certainly been a year like no other, as overnight we converted our entire public school system to virtual. And thanks to the perseverance and innovation and ingenuity and caring of our teachers and staff and administrators, and of course, our students and families, I'm proud to say that teaching and learning continued in every single corner of Washington, DC. And now, however, like everywhere else, we're confronting a number of historic challenges. One third of our early childhood centers remain closed. Months and months of learning is being lost. And we have a far too high rate of joblessness across our city. And these are not challenges that we will solve overnight. There will be no quick fixes. But we're very lucky to have a very strong foundation. We have experienced years and years of dramatic improvements in our public schools. And we have experienced years and years of strong investments by Mayor Bowser. And as you can see, in fiscal 21, despite very challenging financial circumstances, the mayor's budget included a 3% increase in the uniform per student funding formula, which translated into a $1.92 billion public school budget. The budget also included $21.8 million for an expansion of mental health support services, and it included $1.5 billion for renovations and modernizations of schools. Now, the budget we're here to talk about tonight, our future budget, is about building a road to recovery. And I don't just mean for next year. I mean making a down payment on a system that is more innovative and equitable than we've had before. And maybe, just maybe the way we should think about measuring our success is ensuring a wonderful childhood for every young person in Washington, D.C. This would mean a very strong 
early childhood education. So we must continue to strengthen and stabilize our early childhood sector. This would mean providing vital new supports for our schools so that our students get what they need, high intensity tutoring for those who need it, and credit recovery to ensure that our high schoolers stay on track for graduation. And it's not just in schools. Ensuring a strong childhood now means establishing innovative partnerships as we together flood the city with learning and supports for our kids. Partnerships with camps and the Mary and Barry Summer Youth Employment Program, partnerships with community organizations and out of school time, and partnerships with our businesses and philanthropies. We are stronger together. We must heal and recover together. A fantastic childhood in DC, of course, also means having parents and caregivers who have family sustaining jobs. And so we will continue to provide intensive support services to job seekers, increase access to high quality training, and sustain UDC's important work, as the mayor says, as we create pathways to the middle class. And it means, of course, having fun. So we'll provide camps for continued recreation, parks and rec centers for play, and of course, our beautiful libraries for exploration. So as you consider our pitches tonight, and as you spend your dollars, remember we're all in this together, and remember that together we will make DC an extraordinary place for children. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deputy Mayor uh, Kine. I want to remind everyone again, you are now hearing pitches from our deputy mayors because we are about to play the virtual version of the $100 budget allocation game. You can go now to budget.dc.gov to out start allocating your funds as we, but first we want you to hear the pitches from our deputy mayors before you start allocating that money, but that is at budget.dc.gov. I wanna remind everyone I heard uh, some people are having a little bit of trouble hearing on budget.dc.gov. There is a phone number you can dial for sound that is 855-925-2801 and the access code for that is 9046. So again, 855-925-2801, access code 9046 to get sound if you're having any sound issues. To continue our deputy mayor pitches, we are gonna now hear from the deputy mayor for health and human services, Wayne Turnage. Good evening, everyone. As you contemplate the uh, resource allocation plan that you would like to see for the mayor's fiscal 2022 budget, I urge you to give priority consideration to the cluster of health and human service agencies that I represent. As you know, we are in the midst of the deadliest pandemic that this country has seen in more than 100 years. And while the mayor has taken a whole of government approach uh, to addressing this problem, the agencies in the uh, Health and Human Services cluster are on the front line of this response, offering services that are critically important in keeping DC residents as safe as possible. I offer a few points uh, for you to consider. First, the agency that is leading the district's public health response through the rather skillful management of our COVID testing, disease uh, surveillance, and vaccination program is the DC Department of Health. This agency has taken on the enormous challenge of directing these important activities while maintaining its day-to-day -day focus on regular population health activities that are designed to improve health outcomes for all DC residents. Whether it is maternal and child health, combating uh, profound health care inequities across the city, or regulating private services to ensure that they are safely delivered, DC Health will, for the remainder of this pandemic, and into fiscal year 22, continue to invest the resources on both the management of COVID and the execution of its regulatory and population health functions. Second, I ask you to consider that the mission of every remaining agency in the, in the uh, Health and Human Services cluster includes the provision of services to some of the district's most vulnerable residents. This includes residents who are medically fragile due to a high level of uncontrolled disease, residents who suffer from severe intellectual disabilities, residents who struggle with both moderate and severe mental health or substance abuse disorders, residents who are forced to live on the economic margin, relying on incomes that fall woefully short of subsistence wages, residents who huddle in the shelters as their home outside, or worse, live outside on the streets in encampments. 
and residents who rely on the district to pay the full cost of their health insurance because they cannot afford the rise in private insurance premiums. Whether it is providing access to much needed health care by funding an integrated health care system in Ward 7 and 8, moving residents experiencing homelessness into publicly supported housing, delivering crisis intervention services to persons who are plunged into the dark and deadly abyss of addiction, or directing personal care aids to the homes of persons who require help negotiating are just the basic routine activities of daily living. The services that we provide in this cluster are often life-saving, vital supports that these residents so desperately need to escape difficult and sometimes dangerous circumstances. Third, as you might imagine, these services are not inexpensive. In a typical year, the district, as Jenny noted, spends almost 50, over $15 billion on the major functions of government while the services that we provide in our cluster annually account for roughly a third of this amount, over $5 billion. For, as one example, ensuring that four of every 10 residents in the city have access to quality primary, acute, specialty, emergency, and long-term care requires an expenditure, an annual expenditure of more than $3 billion. And as you consider all your allocations tonight, I ask you to contemplate the challenges the agencies that I represent face in delivering these uh, essential services in the swirl, the pernicious swirl of, a COVID, of the COVID pandemic. The leadership and staff in these agencies have been forced to rethink how they ensure that persons uh, who have been forced indoors by the virus can continue to safely access services, in effect reimagining how government can work best for its residents in the midst of a uh, serious healthcare crisis. Consider, Meal services for seniors provided at day programs uh, were, were switched virtually overnight to an expansive home delivery program. DC Health radically changed operating protocols governing the way patients in managed, uh, managed, who are managed in long-term care facilities uh, rec both receive uh, care by, by staff and, and controlling the uh, uh, visitation rates. In some cases, we have been forced to move vulnerable residents those who are at risk for potentially fatal outcomes if they are infected by COVID, completely out of shelters and into hotels that we reserved for isolation and quarantine to protect them. For other residents who are exposed to the virus but have no place to social distance, uh, we reserved hotel rooms to allow for safe isolation. In many cases, for our benefit programs, we were forced to radically alter our automated eligibility systems. The goal was to limit virtually all face-to-face -face contact between residents and caseworkers. So finally, we greatly expanded telehealth services to allow persons to receive care in their homes, thus avoiding what could be a very uh, a, a risky visit to a healthcare facility. The impact, we increased the number of residents who use telehealth to receive care in their homes from roughly 1,250 in the month prior to the pandemic to more than 24,000 eight months later. So in closing, allow me to state that we, as we move forward, much of what we have learned thus far will be permanently incorporated into HHS cluster operations. To ensure that we are successful, I ask you to favorably consider HHS in your allocation plan. Thank you. Up next, we have Deputy Mayor for uh, Public Safety and Justice, Chris Gelthart. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here uh, to partake in the, probably the most important process in our city, which is how do we allocate the funding that we have to our most important programs. I'm here to talk to you tonight a little bit about our public safety and justice area uh, that you have to choose from as you're allocating your funding. Just as we have faced incredible challenges this year in our education and economic areas, as well as in our health areas, we face the same challenges in public safety. Most recently, we faced the public safety challenge of an insurrection from inter internally here in our city where our resources were pivotal to restore safety and order not only to our city but to our nation. This was all preceded by also an unprecedented social justice movement that we've seen this year um, in our city and throughout the country a movement that we can't ignore as we contemplate how we equitably, equitably and with integrity restore 
racial justice and apply our public safety ap approaches to what we're going to do going forward. We also have seen an unprecedented epidemic in gun violence in our city and cities across our nation. So as we think about our public safety and justice programs and where we're going to apply our funding, you'll see, as we have on the slide that you see here, we've actually already, under the mayor's leadership, applied more funding this year towards our pivotal programs that will address that. And those programs of victim services, increased violence intervention, and job offerings, all part of what the public safety and justice participation in is ultimately important in our city, have increased by $3 million just for their victim services, $2.5 million for our violence interruptions, and $5.5 million towards what we really believe is finding off ramps for those that are involved in gun violence and the violent crimes that are happening throughout our city. All of these are pivotal to us in the public safety and justice arena. On top of the improvements that we've made in our fire and EMS system, which we also need to continue to understand, we need the important services of those organizations as well as all the infrastructure that needs to go with it. And that includes new apparatus for our fire department, that includes new facilities for our folks that are working within the fire department and the emergency medical services. All of these are pivotal, as well as that 911 number that you call to get the help. All of these are critical services for the residents of the District of Columbia. All of these under the public safety and justice area, of which we're going to take that entire apparatus and gear it towards the lessons that we've learned this year in ensuring that we're providing equitable public safety and justice throughout our city. Thank you. Up next, we'll hear from the Deputy Mayor for Operations and Infrastructure, Lucinda Babers. Who you gonna call? I'm Lucinda and I have the most important agencies in my cluster, operations and infrastructure, transportation, environment operations. So let me share with you how I need $5 of that $100 for each of these other clusters, because we support them all. So first of all, we have education. And you know we have little Johnny. So little Johnny, when you send little Johnny off to school, little Johnny is looking to walk on sidewalks. That's the Department of Transportation. Or maybe little Johnny rides a bike to school. So he's looking for protected bike lanes. That's still the Department of Transportation. Or maybe you all secure ride share or taxi for little Johnny. Department of Four Hire Vehicles. Bottom line is, who are you going to call? You're going to call Transportation, Operations, and Environment. Now, let's walk over here and look at Health and Human Services. Little Johnny, unfortunately, has asthma. And so I don't know if you all are aware, but the Department of Energy and Environment is responsible for monitoring and regulating the pollution to make sure that little Johnny can breathe on his way to school. And so it's a very critical agency. We do a lot to make sure that your health is taken care of and the environment as we know is precious. I hope you are aware that all of these um, storms that we've been having is climate change. And so our Department of Energy and Environment is taking care of that. But we can't take care of it in FY22 unless I get another $5 of your $100. All right, here we have in the back, you haven't met him yet, but economic development. So when he comes up here, he's going to tell you about affordable housing and just how important it is for him to have money for affordable housing. Well, guess what? Without the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs, that house that you buy is going to fall over on you. 
because nobody has inspected it, nobody has permitted it without the Department of Consumer Regulatory Environment. And then once you get into that home, you're probably going to have some issues and you're going to pull out your insurance policy and not know what to do until you go to the Department of Insurance, Securities, and Banking. So we're going to need another $5, because who are you going to call? Right here in the middle is our internal services. Now, these are our technology, human resource agencies, agencies that you don't really deal with. But guess what? We do. So a lot of DC residents, and so we have to issue them driver's license, register vehicles for them so that they can drive around. So who are they going to call? Yeah, they're going to call us. And then finally, public safety and justice. Vision Zero is critical to our traffic fatalities keeping those down. And so we work very closely. Every one of the agencies in my cluster work with public safety and justice on traffic fatalities. So who are they going to call? They're going to call Operations Environment Transportation. So we need you, and we need your money. Please, I need $25 of your 100. Thank you very much. Up next, we'll go to Assistant City Administrator Jay Melder. Thank you, Tomas, and good evening, Washington. My name is Jay Melder. I'm the Assistant City Administrator for Internal Services. I have that great pleasure uh, to serve in that role under Mayor Bowser and the perilous challenge of having to follow Deputy Mayor Babers in the $100 pitch game. What internal services is all about is about good government. It's about making it work faster, more nimble, and more flexible for you and for the agencies we support. Now, you may be thinking in your $100 game, I'm not going to invest a lot in government services. I'm going to put it elsewhere in programs that I care about and touch uh, the lives of, of me and my family and the people I care about. Internal services supports all of our agencies. An investment in internal services is a force multiplier and is going to make your investment and in all of your other priorities go further, get there faster, and make a bigger impact along the way. Some examples of that, schools. Internal services make sure that the school, that the DCPS schools are clean, they're beautiful, and they're safe, especially during our COVID-19 pandemic and allowing students and teachers to come back to those beautiful spaces and learn. We make sure that students have the devices and the connectivity they need uh, to work and to learn remotely. We're about making sure that our first responders and first providers have everything they need to keep us safe and keep them safe, from the PPE to the new fire truck apparatus that uh, Deputy Mayor Gildhart was talking about earlier. An investment in internal services and an investment in our IT infrastructure from making sure that we have more free public uh, Wi-Fi access to ensuring that you can skip the line and call or go online to get the services you need from those DIMLA agencies, right from the comfort and safety of your own home. It also means that our workforce, 37,000 committed, dedicated public servants, have the IT support they need to do their job for you where it's safe for them too especially during the pandemic where we were able to telework 60% of our workforce to keep them safe, to keep their households safe, to keep our city safe. It's also an investment and a partnership with economic development where we're really proud to work with, with our planning and economic development team, with our Department of Small and Local Businesses to when we have to use our money to buy the services that I'm talking about, that we're buying locally. We're really proud of the fact that this past year, we spent more than a billion dollars with certified business enterprises on the things that we need to keep government running and services operating for you. It also means that we get to make really good investments in where our public facilities are. Are we investing in neighborhoods that are right for revitalization and changing the way that our neighborhoods um, are able to interact because of the government assets that are there. It also means that our government assets and buildings are going to be greener, they're going to be cleaner, 
they're going to be safer, and they're going to be the pride of our city. So when you're putting those $100 down in your budget worksheet, I know that internal services isn't going to top your list. But just know, every dollar you put with internal services is going to be a force multiplier to every other priority you put dollars to. Thank you. And to close us out, Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development and Chief of Staff to the Mayor, John Falchicchio. Well, good evening, Washington, D.C., and thank you for joining us uh, for a budget engagement forum. Of course, we would all love to be together tonight, uh, but we're here gathered uh, in the convention center uh, to talk to you about uh, what our jobs are, what our roles are, and how we help serve uh, the residents of the District of Columbia. And Mayor Bowser has given DEMPED and the Economic Development Cluster a, uh, three tasks to do. The first is to create affordable housing, the second is to create jobs, and the third is to increase our tax revenue. Now, if you think about this as a math equation, if we create affordable housing and more housing, and we create more jobs, we actually grow our tax revenue. So what I'm gonna do is focus on the first two tasks tonight to talk to you a little bit about the work that we do and the investment that we need to make. So Howard University did a study uh, and they studied DC housing production between 20, uh, uh, 2000 and 2018. In that time period, 40,000 new homes were built in Washington, DC. Now, that sounds like a lot of homes, and what it means for folks who lived here was that for those homes that were produced, it actually meant that housing in the District of Columbia was more affordable. If those 40,000 units, those 40,000 homes, were not built between 2000 and 2018, we would actually have uh, rent 5% higher today because that housing wasn't built. Now, what Mayor Bowser has done, and she said it in this very hall for the first time, uh, on January 2nd, uh, 2019, was set an ambitious goal that by 2025, we would build 36,000 new homes, 12,000 of which would be income-restricted affordable homes. So we're making progress on that goal. Uh, since uh, 2019, we've built 14,000 new homes in the District of Columbia. And we've actually uh, built about 2,000 affordable units and preserved even more. Now, that Howard University study looked at this new initiative by Mayor Bowser. And what it found was that if we didn't try to build those 36,000 new homes, rent would again be another 5% higher. So by investing in DEMPED and all the tools that we have to build more affordable housing, you actually help us make housing more affordable uh, for you and your neighbors. So that's task number one. Task number two is to create jobs. And we do that through a variety of mechanisms and we try to really think about how we do that and create more equity. We talked this week about racial equity and how we have to create more opportunity for building black wealth. Investing in economic development will allow us to do just that. When you think about important issues like how we create more food access points east of the river, investing in, a, in economic development allows us to do that. We also know that uh, how we treat our returning citizens is important. We need to empower them and give them more opportunity. Investing in economic development means we can invest in programs like the Aspire program, where we actually work with returning citizens to make them entrepreneurs. And we've had success stories where those entrepreneurs have then created jobs hiring DC residents. So I don't have music to play for you tonight, but I do have the story of Maya. Maya testified at my council oversight hearing uh, yesterday. She's 15 years old, she lives in Ivy City. What she really wants most right now is she wants some place to play this summer. What we're gonna do is we're gonna have a site that will be soon to be redeveloped into a community center, a housing with a great mix of affordable housing. But while we work on the planning of that project, we're gonna make sure that we have basketball courts, tennis courts, and maybe even a community garden that Maya can grow vegetables in this summer. So when you invest in economic development, you're not just investing in the buildings, you're not just investing in the businesses, you're investing in people like Maya. So I ask you, in this $100, what may seem like a game, to invest more in economic development so we can create more affordable housing, more jobs, and increase our tax revenue. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Deputy Mayors, for your pitches. And now we begin the exciting portion of the program where you will get to allocate your $100. Now that you've heard from every one of our Deputy Mayors, you can go now to, again, budget.dc.gov and start filling out how you would allocate your $100 to each of the categories. Uh, we will, at the end of the program, let you know which Deputy Mayor pitch got the most allocation of the budget. But you can also share on budget.dc.gov why you picked that, why you allocated the way you did. What are those budget priorities that you want to share with the mayor? Again, you can also dial our phone number, 855-925-2801, code 9046-NOW, to ask your questions of the mayor of the budget. You can also let us know why you allocated the way you did when we get to your questions. Uh, again, that number is on the screen, 855-925-2801, code 9046. To ask your question of the mayor, you press star and you will be able to start asking your questions now. So please go to budget.dc.gov now to do that. Uh, you can also ask your questions if you're watching on our Twitter or Facebook feed. You can ask your questions there directly and we'll get to some of those questions as well. Uh, to start off our question and answer portion as you're allocating your $100, we have had some questions submitted by residents uh, via video, and so we're going to start with our first video budget question. My name is Brianna Johnson, and I live in Ward 7. My question is, what programs or initiatives will you be supporting to ensure housing for both low- and middle-income residents? Well, I want to thank Brianna for that question, and uh, it is certainly a area of the budget and uh, initiatives in the Bowser administration that we've been focused on during my entire tenure. Uh, you may recall uh, that when I became mayor, we were spending about $50 million out of our Housing Production Trust Fund. We had $50 million to spend in our Housing Production Trust Fund each year. And I committed then uh, to always uh, have at least $100 million dedicated uh, to affordable housing from the Housing Production Trust Fund. And we've been able to do that um, every year for the last six years. And my commitment to doing it moving forward is just as strong. Uh, you heard uh, John just talk about our goal that I set out. Um, and it turns out that if, when you look across the whole region, uh, that all of us, DC and all of the surrounding counties, need to produce more affordable housing so that this region can continue to grow and be competitive. But we've been the only one who's actually set a goal to do it. And not only have we set a goal to do it, citywide, uh, we've set a goal to do it by neighborhood. Uh, and I've tasked uh, the deputy mayor with ensuring that projects uh, move forward in every neighborhood uh, so that we can have affordable homes. Your question's also very good um, because it focuses on how we can support housing um, for our neighbors who have very low incomes and for our neighbors who have middle incomes. And we haven't done um, as good a job as seeing what the government can do to support that middle income housing. Uh, we've also been focused on that and will continue to look for programs. We are very proud of the work that we have done around home ownership. Uh, and continue to look for ways to support neighbors to build wealth in DC um, through home ownership. And I won't recall how we've grown all of these programs, um, but especially for first time buyers uh, in DC, we have a lot of supports for people to buy homes. Great, thank you, Mayor. We're gonna go to our next video question. Hi, my name is Ashley Sanders. This is my son, Brayden, and we live in Ward 4. Uh, we've lived here for nine years now, and my question is around whether or not DCW, DDOT, and DCRA are getting enough resources, especially during COVID, to do their job effectively. Um, the question was, are DPW, DCRA, and DDOT getting enough resources to do their jobs effectively? Um, 
the agency directors will also, and the deputy mayors will say yes, uh, they need more. Um, I will say that uh, I haven't turned down a request to do more. Um, we are going to, we have some pressures, especially um, at D uh, DPW in terms of some of their infrastructure. Um, and in order to keep those facilities safe and to make sure we don't have any interruptions in sanitation services, uh, I know that the city administrator and the DPW team are very focused on how we can do that. I think you saw uh, outstanding productivity in the area of DDOT, especially with fewer cars on the road. Uh, they have been able to, to execute um, their sidewalk, alley, roadway, and bridge projects. The deputy mayor might add uh, to that. Uh, DCRA, I think, was another area of focus. Uh, and they have been able to innovate their processes um, so that they can address permitting and inspections uh, in this virtual environment. And I dare say some things that they have learned uh, will serve us better um, post-pandemic. Uh, so uh, the answer to your question uh, is yes. I think that we've had exactly what we've needed during COVID. Uh, but I think a, a, I would add to that um, because what this budget is um, not intended to do is to bring us back to where we were last year, but to bring us back better and stronger. Um, and so that's what the deputy mayors and the agency directors are thinking about, looking at these budgets, getting all the basics done, uh, but also thinking about their agencies and how they can help, help restaurants come back. How can they help downtown workers come back? How can they make sure that children are going to be back on track? And so those are the types of investments that we're talking about in this budget. Thank you, Mayor. I do want to remind before we go to our next video question, if you have a question uh, by phone, you can dial the number that is on your screen, 855-925-2801, code 9046, and press star, and you will be able to ask your question directly of the mayor. Uh, you can, we're going to go to our next video question, uh, and then we'll go to some of our questions by phone. Good evening. This is Imani Abdullah, and I am a Ward 7 resident, and I am a proud DCPS teacher. I teach special education students in high school. I'm interested in finding out about the school budget and its impact on the special aid resources for the 2020, 21, and 2021, 22 school years. And I was wondering if it would be enough money allocated for SPED students, especially in a COVID-19 learning environment. Well, I want to thank Imani for that question and certainly her service uh, to our students. I know what's been abundantly clear over the last year is how important uh, teachers are in helping our students progress and how much our students miss being in beautiful buildings um, with their teachers. Uh, so I want to thank them for innovating and teaching virtually and doing their very best to make um, their lessons interesting and engaging and staying connected with students. Uh, and we, we really appreciate and thank them in advance for everything that they're going to do um, to help students accelerate their learning. So let me turn to the deputy mayor to talk specifically about uh, special education funding. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, thank you, Amani, for the question as well. And I'd also like to thank you for your service. And your question was specific to whether we have enough resources for special needs students in the system. And I, I know I mentioned at the top of my own remarks that the mayor's budget last year increased the uniform per student funding formula by 3%. And that is the way in which we provide additional resources for students with special needs. And so we were able to increase our budget during this current school year for students with special needs. In addition, we have spent a lot of time in DCPS and across the public charter sector in ensuring buildings are safe and readied for in-person instruction. And the chancellor made very clear early on for DCPS 
that students with special needs would be first in line, amongst the first in line for those in-person opportunities to ensure that students are able to engage with their teachers in ways that will help them be successful. So we continue to invest in ways that will provide the services that special needs students need and we'll continue to work on doing more. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. We have our next question coming online from Eric. This question is for the mayor. Uh, mayor, will you be uh, in the budget allocating more funds for young artists and creatives to support them and maybe through DPR programming as well? You have to, I, you have to give me that again. Yes, the, the question again from Eric uh, online, Mayor, is if you'll be uh, in this budget uh, creating, funding more programs for young creatives and young artists and maybe doing that through DPR and other programming there for young artists. Okay, so how this works is um, we're not prepared to say any specific thing that we will be funding in this budget. Um, but what I take from the question is there's interest in um, more funding for artists in which we're also interested in. This is one industry that has been um, particularly impacted by COVID shutdowns. Um, with theaters closed, live music venues closed, uh, artists have been uh, especially impacted by COVID. Uh, part of our COVID response was to establish a bridge fund, um, which uh, a lot of these venues have been able to apply for or other businesses in entertainment or convening and meetings and conventions and hospitality have been able to apply for. So we see this as a bridge to get post um, pandemic. Uh, you will also be familiar with our uh, 202 Creates program, which is especially uh, focused on investing uh, in the arts and investing in artists, um, but also on demonstrating that DC is a place where our uh, creatives can earn a living, can live here and earn a living and establish uh, a career path. So we um, continue to be um, very interested in investing uh, in 202 Creates and the types of programs it supports. Thank you, Mayor. We're gonna go to our next video question. Greetings, Mayor Bowles. I'm Nathaniel Morgan. I'm a DC resident and also an ex-offender. Uh, my question is, is there any funding available for ex-offenders who are also entrepreneurs? Okay, we've already heard some uh, allusion to, to Nathaniel's question. I think Deputy Mayor Falchicchio can weigh in on Aspire and how that works with our Department of Small and Local Businesses. Great, so the Aspire program is uh, an exciting program that we have to help uh, returning citizens become entrepreneurs. What it does is it actually helps go uh, bring them through a training program where they learn all the basics of how to put together a business plan. And then they get supports in order to start that business and uh, technical support when they do have that business running to make sure that they're successful. Uh, Mayor Bowser, we also uh, have not waited during the pandemic in order to actually create new programming for our artists. Our artists uh, should be uh, business people themselves. So what we've done through the Office of Cable, Television, Film, Motion Picture, and Entertainment, we've actually created uh, new programming online, which are seminars in how artists can become better entrepreneurs. So I'd ask uh, that the questioner uh, look to the Aspire program uh, if they're interested in becoming an entrepreneur, and then if they're interested in particular in the entertainment industry, to look at the Office of Cable Television, Motion Picture, and Film and Entertainment uh, for their seminars about how to start a business and how to grow a business as well. Great, thank you, Deputy Mayor. We're gonna take uh, one last video question and then we're gonna go to the results of the $100 game. So thank you all again. If you have not filled out your uh, $100 game, you can do so now at budget.dc.gov because we're gonna let the Deputy Mayors who have made their pitches know uh, who uh, got the most allocated by residents. So we're gonna go to our last video question. Hi, Mayor Bowser. My name is Julia Weinrod and I live in Ward 3. My question for you is how does your commitment to pathways to the middle class include financial literacy training for teens and adults who are unfamiliar with personal finance? 
Well, that's a great question. Um, and it is something uh, that I know that our uh, public education community is focused on, as well as parks and recreation. Uh, and Jenny, you um, will remind me of an investment we made, I think, to partner um, with a local program, Junior Achievement, mm -hmm. uh, that will also build or make stronger our partnership with DC Public Schools. And Paul or Jenny, if you want to weigh in on that, please do. Um, this is a topic that is of great interest to those of us who work in public education and across all of our schools, there is a version of financial literacy to ensure that our young people are coming up not just with academic skills, but also with important life skills. That's also the reason that we have included it in the Marion Berry Summer Youth Employment Program as a standard part of the curriculum that young people get as they engage in their work-based learning. We are also ensuring that they develop skills to manage finances, to become um, uh, well-versed again in the life skills. So. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. So we now have the results uh, of the $100 game. So we want to thank you all for filling it out. If you have not filled it out, you'll still have time to go a a now or after the budget engagement forum to budget.dc.gov. You can fill out all of our survey questions. And we also have a question there to share your priorities with the mayor, your, uh, what you want to see in this upcoming budget as the mayor prepares it. Uh, and we will be sharing that directly with the mayor and the budget team. So if you weren't able to, to get there now, you can watch the stream later and, and share your priorities right there at budget.dc.gov. We also have a voicemail line there for you that is posted on that page where you can call uh, and leave a voicemail as well of the budget priorities that you want to share with the mayor. Uh, so the, the big drum roll uh, is the winner of the $100 game with $56 on average allocated uh, is housing. So Deputy Mayor Falchicchio got $56 allocated. Uh, we have in second with $41 allocated education. So I want to say, uh, Deputy Mayor Kine, uh, good job on your pitch there. And then our third place allocation is going to be uh, transportation with $35. So good job, Deputy Mayor Babers. I think it was the intro music. So really good work on that. Uh, so we want to thank you all so much for participating tonight. If you were not able to get your questions answered, uh, you can uh, send, uh, again, go to budget.dc.gov. If you would like to send a video question for our budget engagement forum on Saturday, you can email your video to budget at dc.gov. Again, that email address is budget at dc gov and you may be able to see your question answered here on Saturday. So to close us out, we're going to pass it to Mayor Muriel Bowser. Well, I want to thank you all. Did I see the results? Where are they? Okay. Well, do you want to say what they are? So again, you're, they're just on screen right there. Okay. The left all right. I guess not. <laughs> so, um, Kevin, do you want to read out the results? Because I can't see them from here. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, for public safety, uh, 20 out of 100. Uh, now, I've been to many budget engagement forums where I was the deputy mayor for public safety. Uh, congratulations. I think you got more than I ever got Ooh. in prior sessions. Um, uh, so for education, uh, it is 53 out of 100. Uh, housing is 56. Uh, internal services is 30. Uh, transportation, Deputy Mayor Babers asked for 25. She got 35. Uh, and then health and human services, 49 out of 100. Uh, so the average is 49. So um, congratulations on your pitches. Um, and you'll have another chance on Saturday. Yep. Uh, to be able to mix it up and, uh, and overtake housing as number one. And they just made our job even more difficult. Uh, so uh, thank you, deputy mayors. Thanks to the agency directors who are working with these deputy mayors um, to make recommendations to me on our budget that we'll submit to the council. Um, and as is always the process, as Jenny laid out uh, from the beginning, uh, we are doing this engagement, but when I submit the budget to the council, then their uh, engagement process starts and they will announce 
uh, further hearings on uh, my budget proposal until we submit our 25th balanced budget um, and uh, finally approve it this summer. So thank you all. Stay well. Stay safe. Um, remember uh, that we are still fighting a pandemic. Wear your mask. Uh, limit your activities as best uh, that you can. Uh, get tested if you've been exposed and get vaccinated when it's your turn.